the precipice this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by tavarish the precipice by ivan goncharov translated by m bryant preface ivan alexandrovich goncharov 1812-1891 was one of the leading members of the great circle of russian writers who in the middle of the nineteenth century gathered around the sovremennik contemporary under nekrasov's editorship a circle including turgenev dostoevsky tolstoy belinsky and gerzen he had not the marked genius of the first three of these but that he is so much less known to the western reader is perhaps also due to the fact that there was nothing sensational either in his life or his literary method his strength was in the steady delineation of character conscious of but not deeply disturbed by the problems which were obsessing and distracting smaller and greater minds tolstoy has a characteristically prejudiced reminiscence Quote, i remember how goncharov the author a very sensible and educated man but a thorough townsman and an aesthete said to me that after turgenev there was nothing left to write about in the life of the lower classes it was all used up the life of our wealthy people with their amorousness and dissatisfaction with their lives seemed to him full of inexhaustible subject matter one hero kissed his lady on her palm and another on her elbow and a third somewhere else one man is discontented through idleness another because people don't love him and goncharov thought that in this sphere there is no end of variety End quote in fact his greatest success was the portrait of oblomov in the novel of that name which was at once recognized as a peculiarly national character a man of thirty-two years careless bored untidy lazy but gentle and good-natured in the present work now translated for the first time into english the type reappears with some differences Raisky seems to have been born tired he has plenty of intelligence some artistic gifts charm and an abundant kindliness yet he achieves nothing either in work or in love and in the end fades ineffectually out of the story Quote, he knew he would do better to begin a big piece of work instead of these trifles but he told himself that russians did not understand hard work or that real work demanded rude strength the use of the hands the shoulders and the back he is only half a man says mark volokov the wolfish outlaw who quotes proudhon and talks about the new knowledge the new life this rascal whose violent pursuit of the heroine produces the tragedy of the book is a much less convincing figure though he also represents a reality of russian life then and even now the true contrast to raisky of which goncharov had deep and sympathetic knowledge is shown in the splendid picture of the two women vera the infatuated beauty and aunt tatiana whose agony of motherly concern and shamed remembrance is depicted with great power the book is remarkable as a study of the psychology of passionate emotion for the western reader it is also delightful for the glimpses it gives of the old russian country life which is slowly passing away the scene lies beside one of the small towns on the volga Quote, like other towns a cemetery the tranquillity of the grave what a frame for a novel if only he knew what to put in the novel if the image of passion should float over this motionless sleepy little world 
the picture would glow into the enchanting color of life. End quote. The storm of passion does break over the edge of the hill overlooking the mighty river, and, amid the wreckage, the two victims rise into an ability that the reckless reformer and the pleasant dilettante have never conceived. Goncharov had passed many years in governmental service, and had in fact reached the age of thirty-five when his first work, A Common Story, was published. The frigate Pallada, which followed, is a lengthy descriptive account of an official expedition to Japan and Siberia in which Goncharov took part. After the publication of The Precipice, its author was moved to write an essay, Better Late Than Never, in which he attempted to explain that the purpose of his three novels was to present the eternal struggle between East and West, the lethargy of the Russian and the ferment of foreign influences. Thus he ranged himself more closely with the great figures among his contemporaries. Two other volumes consist of critical study and reminiscence. End of preface Chapter One of The Precipice by Ivan Goncharov Translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Boris Pavlovich Raisky had a vivacious, unusually mobile face. At first sight he appeared younger than his years. The high white forehead gave an impression of freshness and vigor. The eyes blazed one moment with intelligence, emotion, or gaiety. A moment later they wore a meditative, dreamy expression. Then, again, they looked young, even childlike. At other times they evidenced knowledge of life, or looked so weary, so bored, that they betrayed their owner's age. At these times there appeared between them three furrows, certain indications of time and knowledge of life. Smooth black hair fell on his neck and half covered the ears, with here and there silver threads about the temples. His complexion had kept the tints of youth except on the temples and the chin, which were a brownish-yellow color. It was easy to guess from his physiognomy that the conflict between youth and maturity was past, that he had passed the early stages of life's journey, and that sorrow and sickness had left their marks on him. Only the mouth, with its delicate lines, with the fresh, almost childlike smile, remained unchanged by age. He had been left an orphan in childhood, and for some time his indifferent bachelor guardian had left his education to a relative, Boris's aunt. This lady was endowed with a rich temperament, but her horizon did not stretch far beyond her own home, where, in the tranquil atmosphere of woods and gardens, in the environment of the family and the estate, Boris had passed several years. When he grew older, his guardian sent him to the high school, where the family traditions of former wealth and of the connection with other old noble families faded. His further development, occupations, and inclinations led him still further from the traditions of his childhood. Raisky had lived for about ten years in St. Petersburg, that is to say he rented three pleasant rooms from a German landlord, which he retained, although after he had left the civil service, he rarely spent two successive half-years in the capital. He had left the civil service as casually as he had entered it, because, when he had had time to consider his position, he came to the conclusion that the service is not an aim in itself, but merely a means to bring together a number of men who would otherwise have had no justification for their existence. If these men had not existed, the posts which they filled need never have been created. Now he had already passed his thirtieth year, and had neither sowed nor reaped. 
he did not follow the same path as the other ordinary arrival from the interior of russia for he was neither an officer nor an official nor did he seek a career for himself by hard work or by influence he was inscribed in the registers of his police district as a civil servant it would have been hard for the expert in physiognomy to decipher Reisky's characteristics inclinations and character from his face because of its extraordinary mobility still less could his mental physiognomy be defined he had moments when to use his own expression he embraced the whole world so that many people declared that there was no kinder more amiable man in existence others on the contrary who came across him at an unfortunate moment when the yellow patches on his face were most marked when his lips were drawn in a sinister nervous quiver and he returned kindness and sympathy with cold looks and sharp words were repelled by him and even pursued him with their dislike some called him egotistic and proud while others declared themselves enchanted with him some again maintained that he was theatrical others that he was not to be trusted two or three friends judged otherwise a noble nature they said most honourable but with all its virtues nervous passionate excitable fiery tempered so there had never been any unanimous opinion of him even in early childhood while he lived with his aunt and later after his school days had begun he showed the same enigmatic and contradictory traits it might be expected that the first effort of a new boy would be to listen to the teacher's questions and the pupil's answers but Reisky stared at the teacher as if seeking to impress on his memory the details of his appearance his speech how he took snuff he looked at his eyebrows his beard then at his clothes at the carnelian seal suspended across his waistcoat and so on then he would observe each of the other boys and note their peculiarities or he would study his own person and wonder what his own face was like what the others thought of him what did i say just now interrupted the master noticing boris's wondering glance to the teacher's amazement boris replied word for word and what is the meaning of this he had listened mechanically and had caught the actual syllables the master repeated his explanation and again boris caught the sound of his voice noticing that sometimes he spoke shortly staccato sometimes drawled as if he were singing and then rapped out his words smartly like nuts well Reisky blushed perspired with anxiety and was silent it was the mathematical master he went to the blackboard wrote up the problem and again began the explanation Reisky only noticed with what rapidity and certainty he wrote the figures how the waistcoat with the cornelian seal and then the snuff spattered shirt front came nearer nothing except the solution of the problem escaped him now and then a notion penetrated to his brain but when it came to equations he grew weary with the effort required sometimes the teacher lost patience with him and generally concluded go back to your place you are a blockhead but if a whiff of originality passed over the master himself if he taught as if it were a game and had recourse neither to his book nor to the blackboard then the solution flashed on Reisky, and he found the answer quicker than any of the others he consumed passionately history novels and tales wherever he could he begged for books but he did not like facts or theories or anything that drew him from the world of fancy towards the world of reality in the geography lesson he could not understand how any boy could answer in class but once out of class he could talk about foreign countries and cities or about the sea to the amazement of his classmates he had not learnt it from the teacher or from a book but he gave a picture of the place 
as if he had actually been there. You are inventing, a skeptical listener would say. Vasily Nikitich never said that. His companions did not know what to make of him, for his sympathies changed so often that he had neither constant friends nor constant enemies. One week he would attach himself to one boy, seek his society, sit with him, read to him, talk to him, and give him his confidence. Then, for no reason, he would leave him, enter into close relations with another boy, and then as speedily forget him. If one of his companions annoyed him, he became angry with him and pursued hostilities obstinately long after the original cause was forgotten. Then suddenly he would have a friendly, magnanimous impulse, would carefully arrange a scene of reconciliation which interested everyone, himself most of all. When he was out of school, everyday life attracted him very little. He cared neither for its gayer side nor its sterner activities. If his guardian asked him how the corn should be threshed, the cloth milled, or linen bleached, he turned away and went out onto the veranda to look out on the woods, or made his way along the river to the thicket to watch the insects at work, or to observe the birds, to see how they alighted, how they sharpened their beaks. He caught a hedgehog and made a playmate of it went out fishing all day long with the village boys, or listened to the tales about Pugachev, told by a half-witted old woman living in a mud hut, greedily drinking in the most singular of the horrible incidents she related, while he looked into the old woman's toothless mouth and into the caverns of her fading eyes. For hours, he would listen with morbid curiosity to the babble of the idiot Fiklusha. At home he read in the most desultory way. He deemed the secrets of Eastern magic, Russian tales and folklore, skimmed Ossian, Tasso, Homer, or wandered with Cook in strange lands. If he found nothing to read, he lay motionless all day long, as if he were exhausted with hard work, his fancy carried him beyond Ossian and Homer, beyond the tales of Cook, until, fevered with his imaginings, he rose tired, exhausted, and unable for a long time to resume normal life. People called him an idler. He feared this accusation and wept over it in secret, though he was convinced that he was no idler, but something different, that no one but himself comprehended. Unfortunately, there was no one to guide him in a definite direction. On the one hand, his guardian merely saw to it that his masters came at stated times, and that Boris did not avoid school. On the other, his aunt contented herself with seeing that he was in good health, ate and slept well, was decently dressed, and, as a well-brought-up boy should, did not consort with every village lout. Nobody cared to see what he read. His aunt gave him the keys of his father's library in the old house, where he shut himself in, now to read Spinoza, now a novel, and another day Voltaire or Boccaccio. He made better progress in the arts than in the sciences. Here, too, he had his tricks. One day the teacher set the pupils to draw eyes, but Raisky grew tired of that and proceeded to add a nose and a moustache. The master surprised him and seized him by the hair. When he looked closer at the drawing, however, he asked, Where did you learn to do that? Nowhere, was the reply. But it is well done, my lad. See yourself what this hurry to get on leads to. The forehead and nose are good enough, but the ear you have put in the wrong place, and the hair looks like tow. Raisky was triumphant. The words, but it is well done, the forehead and nose are good enough, were for him a crown of laurel. He walked round the schoolyard proud in the consciousness that he was the best in the drawing class. This mood lasted to the next day, when he came to grief in the ordinary lessons. But he conceived a passion for drawing, 
and during the month that followed drew a curly-headed boy then the head of fingal his fancy was caught by a woman's head which hung in the master's room it leaned a little towards one shoulder and looked away into the distance with melancholy meditative eyes allow me to make a copy he begged with a gentle tremulous voice and with a nervous quiver of the upper lip don't break the glass the master warned him and gave him the picture boris was happy for a whole week his masters did not secure a single intelligent answer from him he sat silently in his corner and drew at night he took the drawing to his bedroom and as he looked into its gracious eyes followed the lines of the delicately bent neck he shivered his heart stood still there was a catch in his breath and he closed his eyes with a faint sigh he pressed the picture to his breast where the breath came so painfully and then there was a crash and the glass fell clattering on the floor when he had drawn the head his pride knew no bounds his work was exhibited with the drawings of pupils of the top class the teacher had made few corrections had only here and there put broad strokes in the shading had drawn three or four more decided lines had put a point in each eye and the eyes were now like life how lifelike and bold it is thought raisky as he looked at the strokes inserted by his master and more especially at the points in the eyes which had so suddenly given them the look of life this step forward intoxicated him talent talent sang in his ears he sketched the maids the coachmen the peasants of the countryside he was particularly successful with the idiot Fiklusha, seated in a cavern with her bust in the shade and the light on her wild hair he had not the patience nor the skill to finish bust hands and feet how could anybody be expected to sit still all the morning when the sun was shedding its rays so gaily and so generously on stream and meadow within three days the picture had faded in his imagination and new images were thronging his brain he would like to have drawn a round dance a drunken old man the rapid passage of a troika for two days he was taken up with this picture which stood before his mind's eye in every detail the peasants and the women were finished but not the wagon with its three fleet horses in a week he had forgotten this picture also he loved music to distraction at school he had an enduring affection for the dull vasivkov who was the laughing stock of the other boys a boy would seize vasivkov by the ear crying get out stupid blockhead but raisky stood by him because vasivkov inattentive sleepy idle who never did his work even for the universally beloved russian master would every afternoon after dinner take his violin and as he played forget the school the masters and the nose pullings his eyes as they gazed into the distance apparently seeking something strange enticing and mysterious became wild and gloomy and often filled with tears he was no longer vasivkov but another creature his pupils dilated his eyes ceased to blink becoming clearer and deeper his glance was proud and intelligent his breath came long and deep over his face stole an expression of happiness of gentleness his eyes became darker and seemed to radiate light in a word he became beautiful raisky began to think the thoughts of vasivkov to see what he saw his surroundings vanished and boys and benches were lost in a mist more notes and a wide space opened before him a world of motion arose he heard the murmur of running streams saw ships men woods and drifting clouds everywhere was light motion and gaiety he had the sensation that he himself was growing taller he caught his breath the dream continued just so long as the notes were heard 
Suddenly, he heard a noise, he was awakened with a start. Vasivkov had ceased to play, the moving musical waves vanished, and there were only the boys, benches, and tables. Vasivkov laid aside his violin, and somebody tweaked his ear. Raisky threw himself in a rage on the offender, struck him, all the while possessed by the magic notes. Every nerve in his body sang. Life, thought, emotion, broken waves in the seething sea of his consciousness. The notes strike a chord of memory. A cloud of recollection hovers before him, shaping the figure of a woman who holds him to her breast. He gropes in his consciousness. It was thus that his mother's arms cradled him, his face pressed to her breast. Her figure grows in distinctness, as if she had risen from the grave. He had begun to take lessons from Vasivkov. For a whole week he had been moving the bow up and down, but its scratching set his teeth on edge. He caught two strings at once, and his hand trembled with weakness. It was clearly no use. When Vasivkov played, his hand seemed to play off itself. Tired of the torment, Raisky begged his guardian to allow him to take piano lessons. It will be easier on the pianoforte, he thought. His guardian engaged a German master, but took the opportunity of saying a few words to his nephew. Boris, he said, for what are you preparing yourself? I have been intending to ask you for a long time. Boris did not understand the question and made no answer. You are nearly sixteen years old, and it is time you began to think of serious things. It is plain that you have not yet considered what faculty you will follow in the university, and to which branch of the service you will devote yourself. You cannot well go into the army, because you have no great fortune, and yet for the sake of your family could hardly serve elsewhere than in the guards. Boris was silent, and watched through the window how the hens strutted about, how the pigs wallowed in the mire, how the cat was stalking a pigeon. I am speaking to you seriously, and you stare out of the window. For what future are you preparing yourself? I want to be an artist. What? An artist? The devil only knows what notions you have got into your head. Who would agree to that? Do you even know what an artist is? Raisky made no answer. An artist is a man who borrows money from you, or chatters foolish nonsense, and drives you to distraction. Artist! These people lead a wild gypsy life, are destitute of money, clothes, shoes, and all the time they dream of wealth. Artists live on this earth like the birds of heaven. I have seen enough of them in St. Petersburg, bold rascals who meet one another in the evening dressed in fantastic costumes, lie upon divans, smoke pipes, talk about trifles, read poetry, drink brandy, and declare that they are artists. Uncombed, unwashed. I have heard, uncle, that artists are now held in high esteem. You are thinking of the past. Now the Academy produces many famous people. I am not very old, and I have seen the world. You have heard the bells ring, but do not know in what tower. Famous people. There are famous artists, as there are famous doctors. But when do they achieve fame? When do they enter the service and reach the rank of counsellor? If a man builds a cathedral or erects a monument in a public place, then people begin to seek him out. But artists begin in poverty, with a crust of bread. You will find they are, for the most part, freed serfs, small tradespeople, or foreigners, or Jews. Poverty drives them to art. But you, a Ryski, you have land of your own, and bread to eat. It's pleasant enough to have graceful talents in society, to play the piano, to sketch in an album, and to sing a song, and I have therefore engaged a German professor for you. But what an abominable idea to be an artist by profession! Have you ever heard of a prince, or a count, 
who has painted a picture, or a nobleman who has chiseled a statue. No. And why? What about Rubens? He was a courtier, an ambassador. Where have you dug that out? Two hundred years ago, among the Germans. But you are going to the university to enter the faculty of law. Then you will study for the service in St. Petersburg, try to get a position as advocate, and your connections will help you to a place at court. And if you keep your eyes open with your name and your connections, you will be a governor in thirty years' time. That is the career for you. But there seems to be no serious ideas in your head. You catch fish with the village boars, have sketched a swamp and a drunken beggar, but you have not the remotest idea of when this or that crop should be sown, or at what price it is sold. Raisky trembled. His guardian's lecture affected his nerves. Like Vasivkov, the music master began to bend his fingers. If Raisky had not been ashamed before his guardian, he would not have endured the torture. As it was, he succeeded in a few months, after much trouble, in completing the first stages of his instruction. Very soon he surpassed and surprised the local young ladies by the strength and boldness of his playing. His master saw his abilities were remarkable, his indolence still more remarkable. That, he thought, was no misfortune. Indolence and negligence are native to artists. He had been told, too, that a man who has talent should not work too hard. Hard work is only for those with moderate abilities. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of the Precipice by Ivan Goncharov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Raisky entered the university and spent the summer vacation with his aunt Tatiana Markovna Berishkov. His aunt lived in a family estate which Boris had inherited from his mother, a piece of land on the Volga, close by a little town with fifty souls and two residences, one built of stone and now neglected, the other a wooden building built by Boris's father. In this newer house Tatiana Markovna lived with two orphan girls of six and five years old, respectively, who had been left in her care by a niece whom she had loved as a daughter. Tatiana Markovna had an estate and a village of her own, but after the death of Raisky's parents, she had established herself on their little estate, which she ruled like a miniature kingdom, wisely, economically, carefully, and despotically. She never permitted Boris's guardian to interfere in her business, took no heed of documents, papers, or deeds, but carried on the affairs of the estate according to the practice of its former owners. She told Boris's guardian that all the documents, papers, and deeds were inscribed in her memory, and that she would render account to Boris when he came of age. Until that day came, she, according to the verbal instructions of his parents, was mistress of the estate. Boris's guardian was content. It was an excellent estate, and could not be better administered than by the old lady. What a paradise Raisky evolved for himself in this corner of the earth, from which he had been taken away in his childhood, and where he had spent many a summer visit in his school days. What views in the neighborhood! Every window in the house framed a lovely landscape. From one side could be seen the Volga, with its steep banks, from the others wide meadows and gorges, and the whole seemed to melt into the distant blue hills. From the third side could be seen fields, villages, and part of the town. The air was cool and invigorating and as refreshing as a bathe on a summer day. In the immediate neighborhood of the two houses, the great park with its dark alleys, arbors, and seats was kept in good order but beyond these limits it was left wild. 
there were broad stretching elms cherry and apple trees service trees and there were lime trees intended to form an avenue which lost itself in a wood in the friendly neighborhood of pines and birches suddenly the whole ended in a precipice thickly overgrown with bushes which overhung a plain about one and a half versts in breadth along the banks of the volga nearer the wooden house lay the vegetable garden and just in front of its windows lay the flower garden tatiana markovna liked to have a space clear of trees in front of the house so that the place was flooded with sunshine and the scent of flowers from the other side of the house one could watch all that was going on in the courtyard and could see the servants quarters the kitchens the hayricks and the stable in the depth of the courtyard stood the old house gloomy always in shadow stained with age with here and there a cracked window pane with heavy doors fastened by heavy bolts and the path leading up to it overgrown with grass but on the new house the sun streamed from morning to night the flower garden full of roses and dahlias surrounded it like a garland and the gay flowers seemed to be trying to force their way in through the windows swallows nesting under the eaves flew hither and thither in the garden and the trees there were hedge sparrows siskins and goldfinches and when darkness fell the nightingale began to sing around the flowers there were swarms of bees bumblebees dragonflies and glittering butterflies and in the corners cats and kittens stretched themselves comfortably in the sunshine in the house itself peace and joy reigned the rooms were small but cosy antique pieces of furniture had been brought over from the great house as had the portraits of raisky's parents and grandparents the floors were painted waxed and polished the stoves were adorned with old-fashioned tiles also brought over from the other house the cupboards were full of plate and silver there were old dresden cups and figures chinese ornaments teapots sugar basins heavy old spoons round stools bound with brass and inlaid tables stood in pleasant corners in tatiana markovna's sitting-room stood an old-fashioned carved bureau with a mirror urns lyres and genii but she had hung up the mirror because she said it was a hindrance to writing when you stared at your own stupid face the room also contained a round table where she lunched and drank her tea and coffee and a rather hard leather-covered armchair with a high back grandmother footnote tatiana markovna was addressed by her grandnieces and her grandnephew as grandmother and footnote was old-fashioned she did not approve of lounging but held herself upright and was simple and reserved in her manners how beautiful boris thought her and indeed she was beautiful tall neither stout nor thin a vivacious old lady not indeed an old lady but a woman of fifty with quick black eyes and so kind and gracious a smile that even when she was angry and the stormlight flickered in her eyes the blue sky could be observed behind the clouds she had a slight moustache and on her left cheek near the chin a birthmark with a little bunch of hairs details of which gave her face a remarkable expression of kindness she cut her grey hair short and went about in house yard garden with her head uncovered but on feast days or when guests were expected she put on a cap the cap could not be kept in its place and did not suit her at all so that after about five minutes she would with apologies remove the tiresome headdress in the mornings she wore a white white blouse with a girdle and big pockets in the afternoon she put on a brown dress 
and on feast days a heavy rustling silk dress that gleamed like silver and over it a valuable shawl which only vasilisa her housekeeper was allowed to take out of the press uncle ivan kuzmitch brought it from the east she used to boast it cost three hundred gold roubles and now no money would buy it at her girdle hung a bunch of keys so that grandmother could be heard from afar like a rattlesnake when she crossed the yard or the garden at the sound the coachmen hid their pipes in their boots because the mistress feared nothing so much as fire and for that reason counted smoking as the greatest of crimes the cooks seized the knife the spoon or the broom kiryusha who had been joking with matryona hurried to the door while matryona hurried to the buyer if the approaching clatter gave warning that the mistress was returning to the house mashutka quickly took off her dirty apron and wiped her hands on a towel or a bit of rag as the case might be spitting on her hands she smoothed down her dry rebellious hair and covered the round table with the finest of clean tablecloths vasilisa silent serious of the same age as her mistress buxom but faded with much confinement indoors would bring in the silver service with the steaming coffee mashutka effaced herself as far as possible in a corner the mistress insisted on cleanliness in her servants but mashutka had no gift for keeping herself spotless when her hands were clean she could do nothing but felt as if everything would slip through her fingers if she was told to do her hair on sunday to wash and to put on tidy clothes she felt the whole day as if she had been sewn into a sack she only seemed to be happy when smeared and wet with washing the boards the windows the silver or the doors she had become almost unrecognizable and had if she wanted to rub her nose or her eyebrows to use her elbow vasilisa on the contrary respected herself and was the only tidy woman among all the servants she had been in the service of her mistress since her earliest days as her personal maid had never been separated from her knew every detail of her life and now lived with her as housekeeper and confidential servant the two women communicated with one another in monosyllables tatiana markovna hardly needed to give instructions to vasilisa who knew herself what had to be done if something unusual was required her mistress did not give orders but suggested that this or that should be done vasilisa was the only one of her subjects whom tatiana markovna addressed by her full name if she did address them by their baptismal names they were names that could not be compressed nor clipped as for example ferapont or pantelemon the village elder she did indeed address as stepan vasilich but the others were to her matryoshka mashutka yegorka and so on the unlucky individual whom she addressed with his christian name and patronymic knew that a storm was impending here yegor prokhorych where were you all day yesterday or simeon vasilich you smoked a pipe yesterday in the hayrick take care she would get up in the middle of the night to convince herself that a spark from a pipe had not set fire to anything or that there was not someone walking about the yard or the coach-house with a lantern under no consideration could the gulf between the people and the family be bridged she was moderately strict and moderately considerate kindly but always within the limits of her ideas of government if irina matryona or another of the maids gave birth to a child she listened to the report of the event with an air of injured dignity but gave vasilisa to understand that the necessaries should be provided and would add only don't let me see the good for nothing after matryona or irina had recovered she would keep out of her mistress's sight for a month or so 
Then it was as if nothing had happened, and the child was put out in the village. If any of her people fell sick, Tatiana got up in the night, sent him spirits and embrocation, but next day she would send him either to the infirmary or oftener to the wise woman, but she did not send for a doctor. But if one of her own relatives, her grandchildren, showed a bad tongue or a swollen face, Kirusha of Lass must immediately ride post-haste to the town for the doctor. The wise woman was a woman in the suburbs who treated the people with simple remedies and rapidly relieved them of their maladies. It did indeed happen that many a man remained crippled for life after her treatment. One lost his voice and could only crow, another lost an eye or a piece of his jawbone, but the pain was gone and he went back to work. That seemed satisfactory to the patient as well as the proprietor of the estate. And as the wise woman only concerned herself with humble people, with serfs and the poorer classes, the medical profession did not interfere with her. Tatiana Markovna fed her servants decently, with cabbage soup and groats, on feast days with rye and mutton. At Christmas, geese and pigs were roasted. She allowed nothing out of the common on the servants' table or in their dress, but she gave the surplus from her own table now to one woman, now to another. Vasilisa drank tea immediately after her mistress. After her came the maids in the house, and last old Jakob. On feast days, on account of hardness of their work, a glass of brandy was handed to the coachman, the manservants, and the starosta. As soon as the tea was cleared away in the morning, a stout, chubby-faced woman pushed her way into the room, always smiling. She was maid to the grandchildren Verochka and Marfinka. Close at her heels the twelve-year-old assistant, and together they brought the children to breakfast. Never knowing which of the two to kiss first, Tatiana Markovna would begin, well, my birdies, how are you? Verochka, darling, you have brushed your hair. And me, granny, me, Marfinka would cry. Why are Marfinka's eyes red? Has she been crying? Tatiana Markovna inquired anxiously of the maid. The sun has dazzled her. Are her curtains well drawn, you careless girl? I must see. In the maid's room sat three or four young girls, who sat all day long sewing or making bobbin lace, without once stretching their limbs all day because the mistress did not like to see idle hands. In the anteroom there sat idly the melancholy Jakob, Yegorka, who was sixteen and always laughing, with two or three lackeys. Jakob did nothing but wait at table, where he idly flicked away the flies and as idly changed the plates. He was almost too idle to speak, and when the visitors addressed him, he answered in a tone indicating excessive boredom or a guilty conscience. Because he was quiet, never seriously drunk, and did not smoke, his master had made him butler. He was also very zealous at church. End of chapter 2《ヴァンゴンチェロー》で、プレシピス、by Ivan Goncherov、translated by M. Bryant。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Boris came in on his aunt during the children's breakfast. Tatiana Markovna clapped her hands and all but jumped from her chair. The plates were nearly shaken off the table. Borushka, tiresome boy, you have not even written, but descend like a thunderclap. How you frightened me! She took his head in her hands, looked for a full minute into his face, and would have wept, but she glanced away at his mother's portrait and sighed. Well, well, she seemed to say, but in fact said nothing, but smiled and wiped away her tears with her handkerchief. 
your mother's boy she cried her very image see how lovely she was look vasilisa do you remember isn't he like her with youthful appetite boris devoured coffee tea cakes and bread his aunt watching all the while call the people tell the starosta and everybody that the master is here the real master the owner welcome little father welcome home she said with an ironic air of humility laughing and mimicking the peasant's speech forsake us not with your favour tatiana markovna insults us ruins us take us into your charge ha <laughs> ha here are the keys the accounts at your service demand a reckoning from the old lady ask her what she has done with the estate money why the peasants huts are in ruins see how the malinovka peasants beg in the streets of the town ha <laughs> ha under your guardian and uncle in the new estate i believe the peasants wear polished boots and red shirts and live in two-storied houses well sir why this silence why do you not ask for the accounts have your breakfast and then i will show you everything after breakfast tatiana markovna took her sunshade put on her thick-soled shoes covered her head with a light hood and went to show boris the garden now sir keep your eyes wide open and if there is anything wrong don't spare your grandmother you will see i have just planted out the beds in front of the house verushka and marfinka play here under my eyes in the sand one cannot trust any nurse they reached the yard Kirusha, Yeremka, Matryoshka, where have you all hidden yourselves? One of you come here. Matryoshka appeared and announced that Kirusha and Yeremka had gone into the village to fetch the peasants. Here is Matryoshka. Do you remember her? What are you staring there for, fool? Kiss your master's hand. Matryoshka came near. I dare not, she said boris shyly embraced the girl you have built a new wing to the buildings grandmother he said you notice that do you remember the old one it was quite rotten had holes in the floors as broad as my hand and the dirt and the soot and now look they went into the new wing his aunt showed boris the alterations in the stables the horses and the separate spaces for fowls the laundry and byres here is the new kitchen which i built detached so that the kitchen range is outside the house and the servants have more room now each has his own corner here is the pantry there the new ice cellar what are you standing there for she said turning to matryona go and tell yegorka to run into the village and say to the starosta that we are going over there in the garden his aunt showed him every tree and every bush led him through the alleys looked down from the top of the precipice into the brushwood and went with him into the village it was a warm day and the winter corn waved gently in the pleasant breeze here is my nephew boris pavlovich she said to the starosta are you getting in the hay while the warm weather lasts we are sure to have rain before long after this heat here is the master the real master my nephew she said turning to the peasants have you seen him before garashka take a good look at him is that your calf in the rye ilusha she said in passing to a peasant while her attention already wandered to the pond there they are again hanging out the clothes on the trees she remarked angrily to the village elder i have given orders for a line to be fixed tell blind agasha so it is she that likes to hang her things out on the willows the branches will break we haven't a line long enough answered the starosta sleepily 
we shall have to buy one in the town why did you not tell vasilisa she would have let me know i go into the town every week and would have brought a line long ago i have told her but she forgets or says it is not worth while to bother the mistress about it tatiana markovna made a knot in her handkerchief she liked it to be said that nothing could be done without her a clothes line for instance could be bought by anybody but god forbid that she should trust anybody with money although by no means avaricious she was sparing with money before she brought herself to part with it she was thoughtful sometimes angry but the money once spent she forgot all about it and did not like keeping account of it besides the more important arrangements her life was full of small matters of business the maids had to be put to cutting out and sewing or to cooking and cleaning she arranged so that everything was carried out before her own eyes she herself did not touch the actual work but with the dignity of age she stood with one hand on her hip and the other pointing out exactly where and how everything was to be done the clattering keys opened cupboards chests strong boxes which contained a profusion of household linen costly lace yellow with age diamonds destined for the dowry of her nieces and money the cupboards where tea sugar coffee and other provisions were kept were in vasilisa's charge in the morning after coffee when she had given her orders for the farm tatiana markovna sat down at her bureau to her accounts then sat by the window and looked out into the field watched the laborers saw what was going on in the yard and sent Jakob or vasilisa when there was anything of which she disapproved when necessary she drove into the town to the market hall or to make visits but never was long away returning always in time for the midday meal she herself received many guests she liked to be dispensing hospitality from morning to night when in winter afternoons she sat by the stove she was silent and thoughtful and liked everything around her quiet summer afternoons she spent in the garden when she put on her gardening gloves and took a spade a rake or a watering can by way of obtaining a little exercise then she spent the evening at the tea-table in the company of tit nikonich vatutin her oldest and best friend and adviser tit nikonich was a gentleman of birth and breeding he owned in the province two or three hundred souls he did not exactly know how many and never attended to his estate but left his peasants to do as they liked and to pay him what dues they pleased shyly and without counting it he took the money they brought him put it in his bureau and signed to them to go where they pleased he had been in the army and old people remembered him as a handsome young officer a modest frank young man in his youth he often visited his mother on the estate and spent his leave with her eventually he took his discharge and then built himself a little grey house in the town with three windows on to the street and there established himself although he had only received a moderate education in the cadet school he liked to read occupying himself chiefly with politics and natural science in his speech his manners and his gait he betrayed a gentle shyness never obtruded his dignity but was ready to show it if necessity arose however intimate he might be with any one he always maintained a certain courtesy and reserve in word and gesture he bowed to the governor or a friend or a new acquaintance with the same old-fashioned politeness drawing back one foot as he did so in the street he addressed ladies with uncovered head was the first to pick up a handkerchief or bring a footstool if there were young girls in a house he visited 
he came armed with a pound of bonbons a bunch of flowers and tried to suit his conversation to their age their tastes and their occupations he always maintained his delicate politeness tinged with the respectful manner of a courtier of the old school when ladies were present he always wore his frock coat he neither smoked nor used perfume nor tried to make himself look younger but was always spotless and distinguished in his dress his clothes were simple but dazzlingly neat his nankin trousers were freshly pressed and his blue frock coat looked as if it had come straight from the tailor in spite of his fifty years he had with his peruke and his shaven chin the air of a fresh rosy-cheeked young man with all his narrow means he gave the impression of wealth and good breeding and put down his hundred roubles as if he had thousands to throw about for tatiana markovna he showed a respectful friendship but one so devoted and ardent that it was evident from his manner that he loved her beyond all others but although he was her daily guest he gave no sign of intimacy before strangers she showed great friendship for him but there was more vivacity in her tone those who remembered them when they were young said she had been a very beautiful girl when she had thrown on her shawl and sat looking meditatively before her she resembled a family portrait in the gallery of the old house occasionally there came over her moods which betrayed pride and a desire for domination when this happened her face wore an earnest dreamy expression as if she were leading another life far from the small details of her actual existence hardly a day went by that tit nikonich did not bring some present for grandmother or the little girls a basket of strawberries oranges peaches always the earliest on the market at one time it had been rumoured in the town a rumour long since stilled that tit nikonich had loved tatiana markovna and tatiana markovna him but that her parents had chosen another husband for her she refused to assent and remained unmarried what truth there was in this none knew but herself but every day he came to her either at midday or in the evening he liked to talk over with her what was going on in the world who was at war and with whom and why he knew why bread was cheap in russia the names of all the noble houses he knew by heart the names of all the ministers and the men in high commands and their past history he could tell why one sea lay at a higher tide than another he was the first to know what the english or the french had invented and whether the inventions were useful or not if there was any business to be arranged in the law courts tit nikonich arranged it and sometimes concealed the sums that he spent in so doing if he was found out she scolded him he could not conceal his confusion begged her pardon kissed her hand and took his leave tatiana markovna was always at loggerheads with the bureaucracy of the neighbourhood if soldiers were to be billeted on her the roads to be improved or the taxes collected she complained of outrage argued and refused to pay she would hear nothing about the public interest in her opinion every one had his own business to mind she strongly objected to the police and especially to the superintendent who was in her view a robber more than once tit nikonich tried without success to reconcile her to the doctrine of the public interest he had to be content if she was reconciled with the officials and the police this was the patriarchal peaceful atmosphere which young raisky absorbed grandmother and the little girls were mother and sisters to him and tit nikonich the ideal uncle End of chapter three
Chapter Four of The Precipice by Ivan Gencherov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Boris's aunt had only just begun to give him an idea of her methods of conducting the estate when he began to yawn. Listen, these are all your affairs. I am only your starosta, she said but he could not suppress a yawn, watched the birds, the dragonflies, picked the cornflowers, looked curiously at the peasants, and gazed up at the sky overarching the wide horizon. Then his aunt began to talk to one of the peasants, and he hurried off to the garden, ran down to the edge of the precipice, and made his way through the undergrowth to the steep bank of the Volga he is still too young only a child does not understand serious matters thought his aunt as she followed him with her eyes what will become of him the volga glided quietly between its overgrown banks with here and there a sandbank or an island thickly covered with bushes in the distance lay the sand hills and the darkening forest here and there shimmered a sail gulls with an even balancing of their wings skimmed the water and then rose with a more strenuous movement while over the gardens high in the air the goshawks hovered boris stood still for a long time recalling his childhood he remembered that he had sat on this spot with his mother looking thoughtfully out at this same landscape then he went slowly back to the house and climbed the precipice with the picture of her vividly before his mind's eye in malinovka and the neighborhood there were tragic memories connected with the precipice in the lifetime of boris's parents a man wild with jealousy a tailor from the town had killed his wife and her lover there in the midst of the thicket and had then cut his own throat the suicide had been buried on the spot where he had committed the crime among the common people as always happens in cases of this sort there were rumors that the murderer all dressed in white wandered about the wood climbed the precipice and looked down on town and village before he vanished into air and for superstitious reasons this part of the grounds had been left neglected none of the servants went down the precipice and the peasants from the outskirts of the town and from malinovka made a detour to avoid it the fence that divided the raisky's park from the woods had long since fallen into disrepair pines and bushes of hawthorn and dwarf cherry had woven themselves together into a dense growth in the midst of which was concealed a neglected arbor boris vividly imagined the scene how the jealous husband trembling with agitation stole through the bushes threw himself on his rival and struck him with his knife how the woman flung herself at his feet and begged his forgiveness but he with the foam of madness on his lips struck her again and again and then in the presence of the two corpses cut his own throat but he shuddered agitated and gloomy he turned from the accursed spot yet he was attracted by the mysterious darkness of the tangled wood to the precipice to the lovely view over the volga and its banks he closed his eyes abandoning himself to the contemplation of the picture his thoughts swept over him like the waves of the volga the lovely landscape was ever before his eyes mirrored in his consciousness verochka and marfinka provided him with amusement verochka was a little girl of six with dark brilliant eyes and dark complexion who was beginning to be serious and to be ashamed of her baby ways she would hop skip and jump then stand still look shyly round and walk sedately along then she would dart on again like a bird pick a handful of currants and stuff them into her mouth 
if boris patted her hair she smoothed it rapidly if he gave her a kiss she wiped it away she was self-willed too when she was sent on an errand she would shake her head then run off to do it she never asked boris to draw for her but if marfinka asked him she watched silently and more intently than her sister she did not like marfinka beg either drawings or pencils marfinka a rosy little girl of four was often self-willed and often cried but before the tears were dry she was laughing and shouting again verochka rarely wept and then quietly she soon recovered but she did not like to be told to beg pardon Brace's aunt wondered as she saw him gay and serious by turns what occupied his mind she wondered what he did all day long in answer boris showed his sketching folio then he would play her quadrilles mazurkas excerpts from opera and finally his own improvisations tatiana markovna's astonishment remained just like your mother she said she was just as restless always sighing as if she expected something to happen then she would begin to play and was gay again see vasilisa he sketched you and me like life when tit nikonich comes hide yourself and make a sketch of him and next day we will send it him and it can hang on the study wall what a boy you are and you play as well as the french emigre who used to live with your aunt only it is impossible to talk to you about the farm you are still too young she always wished to go through the accounts with him the accounts for verochka and marfinka are separate you see she said you need not think that a penny of your money goes to them see but he never listened he merely watched how his aunt wrote how she looked at him over her spectacles observed the wrinkles in her face her birthmark her eyes her smile and then burst out laughing and throwing himself into her arms kissed her and begged to go and look at the old house she could refuse him nothing so she unwillingly gave him the keys and he went to look at the rooms where he was born and had spent his childhood of which he retained only a confused memory i am going with cousin boris said marfinka where my darling it is uncanny over there said tatiana markovna marfinka was frightened verochka said nothing but when boris reached the old house she was already standing at the door with her hand on the latch as if she feared she might be driven away boris shuddered as he entered the ante-room and cast an anxious glance into the neighboring hall supported by pillars verochka had run on in front where are you off to verochka she stood still a moment her hand on the latch of the nearest door and he had only just time to follow her before she vanished dark smoke-stained reception rooms adjoined the hall in one were two ghostly figures of shrouded statues and shrouded candelabra by the walls were ranged dark stained oak pieces of furniture with brass decorations and inlaid work there were huge chinese vases a clock representing bacchus with a barrel and great oval mirrors in elaborate gilded frames in the bedroom stood an enormous bed like a magnificent bier with a brocade cover boris could not imagine how any human being could sleep in such a catafalque under the baldachin hovered a gilded cupid spotted and faded with his arrow aimed at the bed in the corners stood carved cupboards damascened with ebony and mother-of-pearl Verochka opened a press and put her little face inside, and a musty, dusty smell came from the shelves laden with old-fashioned caftans and embroidered uniforms with big buttons. Raisky shivered. Granny was right, he laughed. It is uncanny here. But everything here is so beautiful. 
cried vera the great pictures and the books pictures books where i don't remember bravo little verochka he kissed her she wiped her lips and ran on in front to show him the books he found some two thousand volumes and was soon absorbed in reading the titles many of the books were still uncut from this time he was not often to be seen in the wooden house he did not even go down to the volga but devoured one volume after another then he wrote verses read them aloud and intoxicated himself with the sound of them then gave all his time to drawing he expected something he knew not what from the future he was filled with passion with the foretaste of pleasure there rose before him a world of wonderful music marvellous pictures and the murmur of enchanting life i have been wanting to ask you said tatiana markovna why you have entered yourself for school again not the school the university it's the same thing you studied at your guardians and the high school you can draw play the piano what more do you want to learn the students will only teach you to smoke a pipe and in the end which god forbid to drink wine you should go into the guards uncle says my means are not sufficient not sufficient what next she pointed to the fields and the village she counted out his resources in hundreds and thousands of roubles she had had no experience of army circles had never lived in the capital and did not know how much money was needed your means insufficient why i can send provision alone for a whole regiment no means what does your uncle do with the revenues i intend to be an artist granny what an artist when i leave the university i intend to enter the academy what's the matter with you borushka make the sign of the cross do you want to be a teacher all artists are not teachers among artists there are great geniuses who are famous and receive large sums for pictures or music and do you intend to sell your pictures for money or to play the piano for money in the evenings what a disgrace no grandmother an artist no borushka don't anger your grandmother let her have the joy of seeing you in your guard's uniform uncle says i ought to go into the civil service a clerk good heavens to stoop over a desk all day bathed in ink run in and out of the courts who would marry you then no no come home to me as an officer and marry a rich woman although boris shared neither his uncle's nor his aunt's views yet for a moment there shimmered before his eyes a vision of his own figure in a hussar's or a court uniform he saw how well he sat his horse how well he danced that day he made a sketch of himself negligently seated in the saddle with a cloak over his shoulders end of chapter four chapter five of the precipice by ivan goncharov translated by m bryant this librivox recording is in the public domain in moscow raisky spent his time partly in the university partly in the kremlin gardens in the evening he sat in the club with his friends hot-headed good-hearted individuals every one of them made a great to-do and confidently expected a great future at the university as at school raisky paid little attention to the rules of grammar but observed intently the professor and the students but as soon as the lecture touched actual life and brought living men romans germans or russians on the scene whether in history or literature he involuntarily gave the lecturer his attention and the personages and their doings became real to him in his second year he made friends with a poor student named kozlov the son of a deacon who had been sent first of all to a seminary 
but had taught himself latin and greek at home and thus gained admission to the gymnasium he zealously studied the life of antiquity but understood nothing of the life going on around him Reisky felt himself drawn to this young man at first because of his loneliness his reserve simplicity and kindness later he discovered in him passion the sacred fire profundity of comprehension and austerity of thought and delicacy of perception in all that pertained to antiquity kozlov on his side was devoted to raisky whose vivacious temperament could not be permanently bound by anything the outcome was the great gift of an intimate friendship in summer Raisky liked to explore the neighborhood of Moscow. He explored old convents, examined their dark recesses, the blackened pictures of the saints and martyrs. His imagination interpreted old Russia for him better than the lectures of his professors. The Tsars, monks, warriors, and statesmen of the past filed before him as they lived and moved moscow seemed to him to be a miniature tsardom here was conflict here the death punishment was carried out he saw tatars cossacks of the dawn the varied life attracted him in spite of obstacles he passed from one course to another at the university he was helped by the reputation for talent he had won by certain poems and essays the subjects of which were drawn from russian history which service do you mean to enter the dean asked him one day in a week's time you will be leaving the university what are you going to do raisky was silent what profession have you selected raisky almost answered that he meant to be an artist but he remembered in time the reception that this proposition had received from his guardian and his aunt i shall write verses he answered in a low tone but that is not a profession you may write verses and yet stories too naturally you can write stories as well you have talent and means to develop it but what profession profession i asked for the moment i shall enter the guards later on the civil service i mean to be a barrister a governor the dean smiled you begin by being an ensign that is comprehensible you and leonid kozlov are exceptions every other man has made his decision when kozlov was asked his intentions he replied that he would like to be a schoolmaster somewhere in the interior and from this intention he refused to be turned aside Raisky moved among the golden youth of St. Petersburg society first as young officer, then as bureaucrat, fulfilled his duties in devotion to the beauty of many an armide, suffering to some degree and gaining some experience in the process. After a time his dreams and his artistic consciousness revived. He seemed to see the Volga flowing between its steep banks, the shady garden, and the wooded precipice. He abandoned the civil service in its turn to enter the Academy of Arts. His education would never be finished, but he was determined to be a creative artist. His aunt scolded him by letter for having left the guards. His guardian advised him to seek a position in the Senate and sent him letters of recommendation but raisky did not enter the senate but indolently pursued his artistic studies read a great deal wrote poems and prose danced went into society and to the theatre indulged in wild dissipation and at the same time did some musical composition and drew a portrait of a lady he would spend one week in dissipation and then next in diligent study at the academy life knocked at the door and tore him from his artist's dreams to a dissolute existence of alternating pleasure and boredom the universal summer exodus from the capital had driven him abroad but one day when he came home he found two letters awaiting him one from tatiana markovna 
the other from his comrade at the university leonid kozlov who had been installed in raisky's native place as a master in the gymnasium during all these years his aunt had often written to him and sent him statements of accounts his answers were short but affectionate the accounts he tore up without having even looked at them is it not a sin she wrote to forget an old woman like me when i am all the family you have but in these days it seems that old people have in the judgment of youth become superfluous but i have not even leisure to die i have two grown-up nieces and until their future is settled to my satisfaction i shall pray god to spare my life and then his will be done i do not complain that you forget me but if i were not here my little girls your sisters would be alone you are their next of kin and their natural protector think too of the estate i am old and can no longer be your bailiff to whom do you intend to entrust the estate the place will be ruined and the estate dissipated it breaks my heart to think that your family silver bronzes pictures diamonds lace china and glass will come into the hands of the servants or the jews or the usurers so long as your grandmother lives you may be sure that not a thread goes astray but after that i can give no guarantee and my two nieces what is to become of them vera is a good sensible but retiring girl and does not concern herself with domestic matters at all marfinka will be a splendid manager but she is still young although she ought to have been married before now she is still such a child in her ideas thank god she will mature with experience and meantime i shelter her she appreciates this and does nothing against her grandmother's will for which may god reward her in the house she is a great help but i do not let her do anything on the estate that is no work for a young girl do not defer your coming but gladden your grandmother's heart she is devoted to you not merely because of the relationship but from her heart you were conscious of the sympathy between us when you were a child i don't know what you are in manhood but you were then a good nephew come if only to see your sisters and perhaps happiness will reward your coming if god grants me joy of seeing you married and laying the estate in your hands i shall die happy mary borushka you are long since of an age to do so then my little girls will still have a home so long as you remain unmarried they cannot live in your house mary please your grandmother and god will not forsake you i wait your coming let me know when to expect you tit nikonich desires to be remembered to you he has aged but is still hale and hearty he has the same smile still talks well and has such pleasant manners that none of the young dandies can hold a candle to him bring him please a vest and hose of samian leather it is worn now i hear as a specific against rheumatism it will be a surprise for him i enclose the account for the last two years accept my blessing End of chapter five